Welcome. On this show, non-factory add-ons, the pleasures and perils. Plus, discover the Corvette Hall of Fame and its one-of-a-kind treasure. But first, how to transport that family pet safely. Joining us is Barb Golden. Welcome, Barb. Well, thank you. Now, I understand you're from the Humane Society. Yes, I am. And this is Hannah. And she is a four-year-old Welsh Corgi. And is here to demonstrate some of the things that we brought along. And all of these are products that are manufactured for the transport of pets? Yes, for safe transport. Okay. Now, this, uh, this device that Hannah has on now is what? This is a seat? This is an actual harness? animal or dog seat belt. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it acts like a harness. It comes around the chest area, around the tummy area. It has quick release buttons in case something would happen mm -hmm. that you needed to get the dog out of the car quickly. And you attach, I have her little leash attached to this, which, you, which is a good oh. safety item. And then this attaches back onto the actual seat belt. It keeps the dog in one place. If you should be hit or something happens, the dog isn't going to fly out of the window or bounce off the windshields. Right. So this is a really good device. If you knew how many times I've driven with a dog jumping around, biting my neck. And <laughs> <laughs> that can be dangerous. Yes, it can be really yeah. dangerous. So this does help contain them. The other thing is uh, when you start using one of these, uh, you don't put it on them and go for a 400-mile drive. You take them to the grocery store, you acclimate them to the, to the actual piece of equipment, and then they accept it. This uh -huh. is a fairly new device, isn't it? Within the last few years, yeah. and I think it's starting to catch on more and more. Not everyone has a van or a station wagon. Mm -hmm. you know, they have a, you know, a family-type car. And I would assume that that would come in a, in a lot of different sizes? Yes. Yeah, it, it comes in different sizes. It's, it also is uh, adjustable. I adjusted the front piece on her. Hannah, come on, over here. That's now how about uh, leashes? Uh, okay. Should you keep a dog leashed or not when they're ac actually in the car? Um, if you have a dog that may, perhaps is not well trained, you want to have a leash on it in order to make a correction, have it sit, and then reinforce it positively. How about children? Is it, have them leashed or not? <laughs> one of my favorite <laughs> things to do, yeah. <laughs> okay? Um, one of the things, speaking of children, when you're in a car with children and a pet in the back seat, when you stop the car, you want to make sure that a leash is attached because children have a tendency to, the car stops, they want to jump out, and the dog wants to go with them. And unfortunately, it can become very tragic. Yeah, where the dog gets out without a leash on, it may not be obedience trained to come back when called. So you have to be very careful with them that they are, don't escape. Are there some other ways to transport? Uh, yes. Yeah. The, um, a lot of us now, I, I personally have not used this very often because my dogs are used to traveling in what we call crates mm -hmm. stay. Um, this is a, a fairly new product, and you can use this on airlines and transport either small dogs or cats, and they will ride up in the compartment with you. You have to check with the airlines, though. And this has a lot of ventilation in it. You just basically sling it over your shoulder, have the animal in it. Mm -hmm. And this would be good probably for short type flights. This would be a good, like a cat carry-on yes. right here. This is yeah. yeah. Or if you, you know, have a cat and you want to take it to the vet, it can, it can have a lot of different purposes. It. But an airline would let you take the animal right on with you. Yeah, you have to like check this. with the airlines, all right, because some of them will allow you to have them right up in, in the compartment with mm -hmm. you. Some of them, if they're, of course, bigger dogs, they're going to ride down in cargo. If that's the case, then this is the type of crate that you would want to use. And as you can see, it has on it live animals, which means this is a, a crate that has been airline approved. You have to have them uh, certain brands of crates th that are airline approved. If you don't want to buy one, a lot of times the airlines will rent them to you. But this is a molded plastic. Um, you simply put the animal into the crate, has a lot of ventilation, and it rides in cargo. I use these in the winter time because they, they have a little bit more um, ability to contain body heat. So mm. in the back of my car, I have a larger one for you my dogs. You put your dog in, the, mm -hmm. in this for in the car? Yeah, yeah. I will use this during the winter time because it helps contain the heat. And I don't have to worry about them going into hypothermia or anything. Right. So what if you have a really big dog or a bigger one? have a really big crate. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? You, you want the crates to be big enough that the dog can stand up, lie down comfortably, and also turn around. 
uh, so that, you know, again, it's, it's a safety device for them. If you're hit or something happens, the dog isn't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not going to bounce. Um, now, this is a crate that I like to use when I travel because it, it acts like a suitcase. And this will actually, this folds down. Okay, we won't put it up all the way, but you get the idea. This is the crate that I use in the summertime when I, when I go off traveling or I go to dog shows. For this size dog? Uh, for this, well, actually, I have a bigger size dog. So oh, okay. whichever dog happens to be going that day, this is the crate that I use. And this, again, is a containment, has the sides and a door, and then the back, you know, and, and it's a very sturdy thing. This is also good for um, when you go to a motel, because a lot of motels will allow you to bring dogs in if you call ahead and tell them that you're going to crate mm -hmm. them, because then they know their curtains, their drapes, everything is going to be safe. Right. But um, you have to check with a particular motel. So this is, a, this is another type of, of containment. Okay, let me see if we're going to hold this down. Now, you have all kinds of different uh, devices that make traveling with pets uh, easier, I see here. Now, this, right. this appears to be some sort of a uh, water bowl that maybe yeah. doesn't leak or what? Yeah, this is, a, this is one that's, um, I call it the Tommy Tippy. If any of you have small children, <laughs> okay, you might not. Uh, this is a very stable water dish. It's called a watering hole. You put the water in here, and basically you can put it on a seat, and it will not tip over unless the dog actually puts its paw in it and flips it. Um, but okay. it, it's, it's also good because it's plastic. You don't want to take anything, anything in the car that would be made out of ceramics or glass. And uh, so it's a very sturdy. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dog lips. <laughs> Mighty tasty, I don't mind telling you. Okay, well, uh, would you like to show us? Maybe we could go up and you could actually show us how the seat belt works. Okay, that'll be fine. The actual dog. That'll be fine. Coming up, money-saving car tips, plus Lucille finds trouble in the mechanic's corner. Stay with us. Hi, Lucille. This is Allison Geiger. 
she had called to come in and talk about a noise. Tell me about it, Allison. Um, when you make a sharp right or left hand turn, you hear a very loud groaning or moaning sound. But it's a moaning as opposed to like a grounding, yes, a grinding or definitely. a real metallic sound. Yeah. And you, you get it always when you make an extreme turn, not mm -hmm. just on a normal turn. Right, right. Okay, um, let's take a look under here. Okay. We're going to have to. Could you get the noise sitting still? Um, I think you might have to be moving. I'm okay. Not okay, well, we'll take uh, a look at a couple of things. At the initial description of this, I was expecting maybe, uh, you know, an axle problem or something. But what you're saying now, you know, we could have a problem with that power steering and mm -hmm. um, for the belt on the power steering. But if it's a moaning, we want to take a look at that level. They're kind of hard to get to on some of these. <laughs> Does that look low, Pete? Oh, okay, because see, that's the first sign of a, of a low power steering fluid would be the groaning. Okay. And especially on extreme turns. Why don't we fill this up? We'll put some fluid in it, and then you drive it uh, and make sure the noise is gone. Now, the noise disappears. You ought to come in. All right. So that we can check and see why you're low on power steering fluid. You don't use that kind of fluid. It must be leaking or something. Uh, why don't you get some feet and we'll just fill this up. Have you noticed anything underneath where you parked the car? Any um, spots or anything? I haven't noticed, but there are spots in the garage. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's from old stains or, or new, but... Okay, well, I would pay for it. Why don't you go home and clean it up? Okay. Clean the garage floor so you'll have something fresh, and then put some papers under it. Let's watch this a little bit. Okay. Uh, we could pull it in and check it now, but I'd like to have you drive it and make sure the condition uh, it goes away first. Mm -hmm. And then we'll deal with it because it's not completely out or you would, you know, the lower it gets, the more noise it'll make and on less extreme turns. Okay. So we'll put the fluid in it right now and then you check back with me in a few days. All right. Okay? Thank you. A wise man once said, a fool and his money are soon parted. So don't be a fool and spend your hard earned cash on a bad service contract. Here's a checklist of some money saving tips. A service contract is not your car's warranty but an insurance plan that adds coverage not included by a car warranty. If you decide to buy a service contract, then by all means do a little homework. Check into the company's business track record by calling your local Better Business Bureau to see if the company has any outstanding unsettled claims. It may be worth a call to the state attorney general's office to see if they have any information on the company in question. But you may want to bank the money earmarked for a service contract to cover any unexpected car expenses. Who knows, it could come in handy for a rainy day. Car makers have been trying to get the word out about the hazards of drinking and driving for many decades. Here's one of the earliest messages wrapped around warnings about other reckless driving stunts. Indeed, some of the driving habits you observe every day on the highway are too risky for these daredevils of the speedway. For example, the common practice of crowding the center line on the highway would put a speedway champion's hair right up on end. You're traveling at 50 miles an hour. The approaching driver is traveling at the same speed. That's virtually 100 miles an hour and within handshaking distance. And how many times have you started to pass up some slower car and then squeak through by the skin of your teeth? If that car is traveling at 50 miles per hour, it represents the same obstacle as 10 parked cars. The chance is not so inviting now, is it? Railroad crossing signals are installed as a warning, not as a challenge. Yet there is always some impatient motorist willing to gamble. If he wins, it means only the saving of a few seconds. If he loses, well, do you think those seconds were worth the risk? Alcohol in the radiator of a motor car is a necessity. But alcohol in the operator is one of the outstanding causes of accident. You wouldn't ride with an airplane pilot who had taken even one cocktail. And a drink on the road may be just as hazardous as a drink in the air. Stay tuned. The hottest add-on trend lighting up the night. Don't go away.
This beautiful car is a perfect example of non-factory add-ons. We'll be back and look at that in a few minutes. But first, let's meet George Fidel. Welcome to the show, George. Thank you. Well, where do we start? These are all non-factory add-ons. Well, today's cars, you can get a lot of things from the dealership already at the dealership from made, put on from the factory. But if you find that, some, that special car that you want to add a cruise control to because the dealer didn't have one on the lot with, or add power door lock system, or rear defogger, we have those available to put on. This is a, an add-on cruise? Correct. It has, uh, you can get a factory type lever, or an, you know, there's a various types of levers right. for each type of car. Uh -huh. And over here we have electric door locks that can be added. I could not imagine those would be available. Well, the uh, aftermarket industry is pretty resourceful. Uh, they've packaged an electric door lock motor and a controller and a wiring kit so it can be added to virtually any car on the road. George, this is kind of a new business, isn't it? Add-ons. Years ago, you would never have dreamed of putting something on your car well, after you got it. I personally have been installing stuff for dealers for over 20 years. Uh, would you put any of these on some of these late models with the real intricate electronic systems and it's, everything? It's not a problem. The manufacturers of the equipment have already taken that into consideration and provide us with uh, a various amount of information to hook into factory electrical systems. Oh, okay, because I've seen a few cars come to the shop that had problems because of installation and I would think that would be a lot of liability. Um, the liability issue is taken up by the manufacturers, but it's really up to the shop to provide good installation yeah. expertise. Well, I'm sure that your shop does because I know you put in an awful lot of things out there. Yes. This is entirely new, right? Well, that's, that's where some of the new styling mm -hmm. trends come in, such as the neon license plate frames and the various undercar neon kits that light the ground underneath the vehicle. I want to go over and look at that car. I'm dying to see that neon underneath there. It's very pretty. Dudes, this is really very interesting. How many tubes are under here? Well, there's four tubes. One on either side, one in the front, and one in the rear. Now, is this an ex it looks to me like it could be hit by a stone or something so easily. The fragile glass tube is encased inside of an acrylic uh, Lex, uh, acrylic or Lexan plastic tube, it's sealed at both ends where the wires come out. It's pretty, pretty impervious to stone damage. If you were to, to crash on a curb, it would break it. Okay, and how much does this cost? Uh, roughly runs anywhere from $349 to $450 installed. So for $400, I could do my car? Probably. I'll try that. One thing makes me wonder, though, uh, driving this along with all the lights coming underneath, do you ever run into police problems? Uh, the police generally don't give you a problem with undercar neon unless you're causing a hazardous situation. But it technically is against the law, is that correct? I can't, I can't for sure tell you the law myself. I've well, had a couple customers get tickets. Okay, so that it remains to be seen what's going to happen with this sort of thing. Exactly. Because as it uh, tends to grow, this whole industry, why, maybe they'll have to make some laws. I'm sure the legislators are working on it even as we speak. Probably. Hey, George, thank you very much. This has been most enlightening. Thank you very much. Hey, Lucille, how do you like my little red Corvette, huh? Well, when we come back, we'll have a visit to the Corvette Hall of Fame. Don't go away.
So, you like this little toy, Lucille? You want to take a spin, Gary? Well, right after we take a visit to a man's personal salute to the Corvette, it's in Cooperstown, New York, just down the road from the Baseball Hall of Fame. When thinking of American sports cars, the Corvette is a standout. For Alan Sherry of Cooperstown, New York, it's much more than a car. He created the Corvette Americana Hall of Fame to prove it, just down the road from Baseball's Hall of Fame. Well, I think one of the definitions of America's baseball hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. They had the baseball hot dogs and apple pie. I brought the Chevrolet. I guess the initial conceptualization for this started about 20 years ago. So I was collecting little Corvette things as early as five years old. The 30,000 square foot museum boasts 35 rare collector Corvettes that make up only part of its seven million dollar inventory. The Corvettes on display range from 1953, the first year of production, right through today. When I was 18, I bought the 53 vet for $1,100. The one that's in the first room in the museum. It's a $150,000 car today. <laughs> What makes this a one-of-a-kind museum is the way the cars are presented. Each vet is built into a diorama, inside a recreation of an American landmark. The 68 overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge. The 70 is at the base of Mount Rushmore. And the 71 really should have its windows up since it's so close to Niagara Falls. You never know what to expect from one exhibit to the next. Well, my idea was to make it a time tunnel with each room a time capsule for that year, so little bits of music can tell the show sports and the events personalities of each year in that room. There is even a room dedicated to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and its special relationship with the Corvette sports car over the years. Right with the, the 90, 86, and 78 pace cars with bricks from the old brickyard on the floor and giant photo murals around them, so you have the ambiance and the feeling of the Corvette at Indy. there's more than just cars on display. If it has to do with Corvette, Sherry bought it and has it on display. The museum has every conceivable Corvette-related item, from postcards and emblems to engines under glass. Corvette bubblegum cards, the promotional models that the dealers made, the original models, every magazine that had a Corvette on the, the cover of it, every sales brochure, all its manual. As creator and researcher of this homage to Corvette, Sherry has a background as colorful as his museum. He's done everything from digging for Mayan artifacts to managing rock bands. Well, I have a doctorate in cultural anthropology and archaeology, so of course museums and, and restoring bits of the past are part of my life. And the music and television you, you have in here is from my background for writing for uh, all sorts of music magazines, television magazines, things like that. Along with collecting all the cars, Alan traveled all over the country to shoot the photographs that make up the background for each display. Those photo murals alone cost half a million dollars to produce. With so many rare and special Corvettes in one place, choosing a favorite is quite a feat. I guess my favorite one is the one in Atlantis, the 63, that's silver, that I bought when I was 19. Uh, I took a girl to the senior prom when I was 19 and was 17 in that car, <laughs> and I still have it. <laughs> but don't expect to see only cars. There's also a pop culture section that will have you taking a trip down memory lane. You don't have to have a doctorate in something to appreciate what I've done here. Not that I'm not saying it. it's important to have that, too. Okay, but... I just wanted to give as many people and to give them some fun. I think we all need some fun in our lives to play nowadays. That's our show for today. Thanks. We'll see you next time on Lucille's Car Care Clinic.